Good morning, good morning everybody. Exciting times here in the Maasai Mara. That's my new way of saying Maasai Mara. Uh, my name is James Henry. I've got a very detestable earpiece in my ear that is not working properly. Fergus is on camera. Hello, Fergus. We've seen a saddle build stalk already and there are also some cheetah over there. Uh, we are just as live as they are in Juma. Hashtag Safari Live, of course, is how you get hold of us. If you're wondering why it looks like there's a car park over there, well, that's because there is a car park over there on account of the fact that there are two cheetah. And there are many tourists enjoying the cheetah here in the Mara of the morning. I'm not sure that made sense. Anyway, it is the morning in the Mara and it is very beautiful here. It's an hour later than it is in South Africa, which means that it is, well, about 20 minutes to eight o'clock. It's probably sitting around about, let me just lick my finger. It's probably sitting at around about 19 or 20 degrees Celsius, which is about 68 or 69 degrees Fahrenheit. There's a gentle breeze blowing in from the north. And if you were lucky enough to be on uh, the Governor's Balloon Safari's Facebook page earlier, you would have seen that the wind that is currently blowing blew Senzo across to where he has currently landed about 20 kilometers from where we are now sitting. That cheetah is part of a coalition of two, as I said, they seem to be on the hunt. There were some reedbuck around here. They were harassed briefly by some buffalo. And now we're going to wait and see what they do. There was quite a lot of rain in this area yesterday evening, and the soils are not particularly good after rain, and so we're going to be very careful about where we drive. We cannot move forward from our current position because then we will get stuck. And uh, I know that Brent, a while back, did a fairly lengthy tree tires on who, uh, on you know, giving I don't know what it was called, the marshmallow award or something to the person who gets stuck first, and he was alluding to the fact that he thought he knew who was going to get stuck first. He was, of course, referring entirely to me. Uh, that is because I ha would love to say it was because he's being mean, but it is not. It is because I have an alarming propensity to get vehicles stuck at the drop of a hat, and so we won't be pushing our luck too much in this marsh today. Hello, Amy. You say, how fast does a cheetah run? Well, Amy, I imagine that there's probably some variation, but the sort of standard issue answer is about 100 kilometers per hour or 60 miles per hour. So that is pretty quick. It is the fastest land mammal in the world. And in fact, no, it doesn't run, no. In fact, there are flighted things that will fly at level flight even faster than that. But it is the fastest land mammal, of course and it is totally over-specialized for speed. The reason I say that, of course, and it's fascinating, if we, next time we're in the studio, I'll try and show it to you. Right, I'm, I'm going to have to pause every time I get a question, I'm afraid, everyone, because my comms and my earpiece are just, they're too, they're too soft. So, Kobe, hold on with, to your question. I will answer it now. Just want to finish this little statement I was going to make about the cheetah and their over-specialization. We've got a cheetah skull and a leopard skull in the studio back at Angama Mara, and it is fascinating to look at the difference, and you can see how much weaker and how much, uh, well, how much less muscle there is on the skull or would have been on the skull because, of course, they have to reduce the size of the skull in order to, well, make space for the nostrils, which, well, which need to take in a huge amount of oxygen for the speed that they manage and for the energy that they need to expend. Then, Kobe, you're wondering if this cheetah has a name. You're 15 years old. I think this cheetah probably does have a name. I don't know what it is, though. There are two cheetah here, and I'm sure that they do have names. I've sent a message just now to the cheetah research group, and the cheetah research group has not replied to me yet. You can see they are definitely filmmakers over that side. And then Fergus says they're not very really thoughtful filmmakers because they've parked themselves right behind where our shot is. 
You know, if we had a cannon on this car, we might fire a broadside just to get them to move. We should probably get something like that, don't you think, Fergus? I think that would be an excellent idea. Or an enormous paintball gun. <laughs> that would teach him. He'd have to clean his lens then. Can we still see the cheetah or they're gone? I can't see anything from where I'm sitting. Cece, I'm not sure I heard you correctly. Uh, in fact, I'm pretty sure I didn't. Louise has just fed through your question that says, it looks like there's a rubbish cater. I don't know what that means. Let's try it again, Louise. Oh, it looks like a young one. Uh, yes, Cece, I don't think they're... Uh, there's, I don't know how old they are, actually. My experience of cheetah is limited, and these are quite far away. Uh, but I would agree with you, they don't look as big as some I've seen. But they always look younger than they are, especially at this distance. Because their heads are so small, they don't have that bulky, powerful look that leopards get. And I know that most of our Safari Live viewers, of course, are far more used to looking at leopards than they are used to looking at cheetah. And that means that they can be slightly unfamiliar until you get close up and then you can see their age a bit more. So I'm thinking of the two cheetah brothers that we used to see at Cheetah Plains quite a lot. Once you got up close to them, you could see the scars and they, they would just looked a little more bulky than these ones, I must confess. So these chaps probably aren't that old. They're probably just recently separated from their mums. I don't know if they are males or females. They're almost certainly one or the other. Uh, now, Beth, you're wondering if cheetah are more or less habituated to the vehicles than the other cats here. Beth, I don't think it makes any difference, really. Um, I think they're about the same. Just remember, the reason that, or the speed with which animals will habituate to vehicles largely has to do with the confidence that they are able to bring to bear. Now, if you're a cheetah, you are right at the bottom of the predator hierarchy, which means that you are, by nature, going to be more careful, more circumspect about who you allow to be around you or in your space. And so that will take a bit more time to habituate to vehicles than something like a lion, for example, which, of course, is the uber predator out here, and therefore doesn't have anything to fear from anyone, and so they will habituate much more quickly. Hyenas the same, wild dogs the same, and then when you get to leopards and cheetahs, they take a bit longer. But this, remember, we're in a place called Governor's, or in the marsh, actually. We're very near Governor's Camp. And Governor's Camp is uh, it's a very famous area. This area that we're in now is a very famous area. And I think you'll find that these cheetahs have experienced vehicles since birth, and I think that's why they're completely comfortable. Yeah, they do look young now, don't they? I'm hoping to get a bit more experience of cheetahs while we're here in the Mara, because, like I said, my experience of them is... ...and look at it and say, well, it's probably X old, etc., but I can't do that with this one. Louise, sorry, I was talking while you were giving that question, which means I didn't hear it. Ah, Velma, you want to know how many cheetah are estimated to be in the area. I think that there are at least, uh, what is it? It's probably about 35 or so known individuals. There is a cheetah group, and, I mean, these chaps do some wonderful work. It's um, uh, The best place to find them is maralions.org, and that will then link you across to the cheetah sort of page, if you like, of the same same research group and it's a couple and they operate not too far from where we're sitting right now the, he does the lions and she does the cheetah and they do a fantastic job and they publish a lot of information about what's going on here so go to maralions.org and you'll find probably a lot more information on the cheetah of the area
Fergus, not often that you've got to film Cheetah live, no, is it? I've never seen the guys at Juma. No, you've never seen the ones at Juma? Well, these are the ones, the Mara in the Marsh and the Mara. Now, Kylie, you're wondering if cheetahs hunt together, and they do, you know, and Scott, later on, if he can get his vehicle going, it's broken down currently, is going to try and find a group of five cheetah brothers that live not too far from where I'm sitting, and they had a, we had a wonderful sort of video sent to us the other day of five of them taking down an adult wildebeest. It was very harrowing because they're not powerful like lions, which means they really had to harass this thing to eventually kill it. Uh, but they do hunt commun uh, communally, especially males, together. They're what you might describe as semi-social. So if these are two brothers, then they will stay together. If they're a brother and a sister, they will split. The females like to live on their own. Oh, there's something running towards them. Watch out. Lexi, you want to know if they communicate with their ears like lions do? Lexi, um, I don't think they do. I think they communicate probably entirely on sight. Um, there may be some signal from their ears, but, you know, a cheetah's method of hunting is completely different or distinct from a lion's. A lion's is a stalking hunt, and, and they use this sort of teamwork to engage in a pincer movement, if you like. But these chaps... Don't do that. They spot prey like they have now. There's a, an impala or a reed buck just to the left of them. And then they just run. Then they just chase it. They rely on their speed. I'm just going to put my binoculars up. It's a reed buck walking through some fairly marshy land. It's quite a distance from them. It's probably a good 150 meters. And I don't think... Well, here they go. They're having a go. I think they're going to struggle to move through that sort of terrain. Let's see what they do. I can sneak very slightly forward. Shall we do that, Ferg, or do you want to just sit tight? Okay, that's going to sit tight for now. and it goes da, 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 and ruins his picture. Now, Keith, you're wondering about the biggest prey that a cheetah could kill. Well, I think you'll find that wildebeest that those five chaps took down two or three days ago is probably about as big as a cheetah's prey can get. They'll need to be very careful of trying to take on anything larger than that. These chaps, this reedbuck will be roughly around the biggest size. The reedbuck is now running, I'm afraid. They're not going to get it. Although it's now on much more solid ground. Can you see it there, Ferg? It's sitting just behind a saddle built stalk. Just to the lefty of that. Uh, oh, there's another one. That's a male. It's quite nice to see a reed buck in amongst the reeds in the marsh. Anna Marie, you're wondering about the favourite prey of cheetah in the Mara. I think you'll find that they largely take Thompson's gazelles. I think that will be the bulk of their prey. It's about the right sort of size. Um, I forget the exact mass of a Thompson's gazelle. I'll check it for you now. Um, but I think you'll find that the Thompson's gazelles are the ones that take the biggest pasting from the cheetah in this area. I'll just find me a book. And then I'll tell you the mass of the Thompson's gazelle. But they'll take impala from time to time. I imagine the big males will take some Grant's gazelles from time to time. Um, they could take reedbuck. Two of them could easily take a reedbuck. And, of course, the coalitions can take things like wildebeest. 
just to find the gazelles. I will find them eventually. There we are. Grants, Somerums, Tunners, Brights. Where is the Thompsons? There he is. They weigh in at the males 20 to 35 kilograms. So that is about, well, a big male cheetah will probably weigh about a maximum of 60 kilograms or so, probably lighter normally. So let's say maximum weight or an ideal weight of about two thirds the mass of the cheetah. They're definitely hungry, they're definitely looking for something to eat, but like I say, I think this is this landscape is probably too inundated for them. I think they'll get their feet stuck and they won't be able to accelerate to quite the speed that they need to in order to take something down. So I, if they were very clever, they'd cross over this watery patch that we have in front of us and go back behind us to where we saw some Thompsons gazelles on much harder ground. They, of course, are not Thompsons gazelles, they're Thompsons gazelles. There's no p. Bobby, you say do cheetahs stalk their prey? Bobby, they do, to a certain extent, but not to the same extent as leopard or lions do. They stalk for a while, and then they give chase, then they run. They are essentially coursing predators in the same way that a wild dog is a coursing predator, I suppose. And sleep. Well, that's disappointing. Oh, well, where's the other one, Fergus? Also there. Yeah, I can't see the other guy. Fergus can't see the other one. There, you can hear the hardy dar ibis. Well, one's up. It's not doing a great, a great amount though. Maybe they will have a snooze here. Now, Kobe, you. <laughs> You're wondering what a cheetah alarm call sounds like. They don't really have an alarm. Well, I suppose they do. And the only reason I know that, of course, is because I went to a, a cheetah sort of rehabilitation farm in Namibia once, where they had been released into the wild, and they allowed us to walk with the cheetah. And we got to within, oh, I don't know, 10 meters or so. And then one of them gave a bit of a sort of growl. It's a growl. It's not a very deep throaty growl, but it is a growl. And you know, they look, they look fairly innocuous at this distance, but up close, and I'm sure many of you will know this, of course, from when we have had closer sightings, they can be fairly intimidating looking. But they are easily habituatable on foot. They're almost entirely domesticatable. Except they don't like to breed in captivity, of course. All righty, I think we're going to... We'll sit here for a little bit longer, see what happens, but they are getting a bit far away, and I can't really cross this uh, watery patch, I'm afraid. So let's head across to Tristan, find out what he's doing this morning there in the cold winter of South Africa.